So when we talk about community, we can talk about it from either a micro perspective or a macro perspective. And my opening words this morning were more looking at community from the macro perspective, the perspective of humanity as a whole. And over the years, we've done a lot of talking to, about community from both the micro and the macro perspective. Grand Junction Mutual Aid, what we do here as a community, what it means to be an American, what it means to be a citizen of, of Grand Junction, what it means on a smaller level to be part of this UUCGV community, or even members of a family. And so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about both understandings of community, because we need the big picture and the immediate picture of what community looks like. And so the big picture that I've been thinking a lot about over the last few years is what does it mean to be a human being on planet Earth in the year 2022? And what does community look like from a larger macro perspective of a collective humanity? We are seeing just even this month how interconnected the world is right now in a way that it hasn't been for thousands of years. In the blink of an eye or just looking at one little thing on this phone, we can know right now while I'm talking what's going on in Russia and Ukraine from somebody who's living there. So community is changing in a global perspective. But then we also have the immediate community that is here in front of us today as members of the United States, as, as members of UECGV, as citizens of Grand Junction. And so I just want us to take a few minutes to think about the word belonging. I invite you to just close your eyes for a moment and ask yourself to remember a time when you felt like you truly belonged. Where were you? What were you doing? What are the emotions that came with that feeling of deep belonging? Who were the people there with you? Were they people? Or was it perhaps being with a certain animal or by yourself feeling like you truly belong in nature? What does belonging feel like? Over the years, we have heard and used the term beloved community many times. But sometimes I wonder, what does beloved community even mean? Because sometimes, to be honest, I feel like those are, that's just not more nice religious language to make us feel good. But what is beloved community? Actually, Martin Luther King coined the phrase beloved community and envisioned it as a society based on justice, equal opportunity, and love of one's fellow human beings. He had a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. And when referring to beloved community, King said, quote, our goal is to create a beloved community. And this will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. This will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. 
the micro and the macro. And I think of those words today in relation to both our Grand Junction community and our rural community. About five or six years ago now, Grand Junction and the Western Slope, we had a number of young people who took their lives in the course of about six months. I think we had seven or eight youth and young adults take their lives in this time period. And it was extremely alarming for this community. And as part of the response to what we um, could do to address this issue, I, along with a number of faith leaders in our community, spent a weekend going to a workshop addressing the issue of teen suicide in the Valley. It was an extremely valuable training but one of the things that really stuck with me was the idea, and I hadn't thought about this until I took that training. One of the things that has changed in our culture is that many young people don't have adults in their lives outside of their immediate family. When these young people need guidance or wisdom, they're not necessarily going to their parents or their teachers or their aunts or their uncles. They're going to Google or TikTok and they're getting advice on devices from their peers. And needless to say, sometimes that is not the best advice. And so, and I've shared this with those of you who have been members of this congregation for a while. I've talked about this before, but I was thinking about my own childhood and I knew the adults in my life. I knew the parents of my friends next door. I actually knew all of the people who lived next door to me and I knew, knew their names. I had a piano teacher that I interacted with. I had coaches who were adults and role models. I had a number of people who were not my age in my life being role models for me. And so it was really kind of a shock to learn and to realize that today so many kids don't know or have a relationship with adults outside of their very immediate circle. And that the first place they go when they have a question is to their device. It's a new normal, I think it's a new reality. And, and these devices, they're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. And they can be used as a tool. They're not necessarily good or bad in and of themselves. It's just a new way that we are interacting in the world with that macro and that micro. That we are more as a world, more interconnected than we've ever been. Um, Nathaniel is taking German class and he had to do a presentation not too long ago, earlier in the year. He's a sophomore this year. And he did this cute little video and part of the video, he had this um, teenage girl standing in front of a screen like speaking German, pretending that she was a German newscaster. And I said, Nathaniel, who is that? And he said, oh, that's my friend from Germany. I was like, you have friends in Germany? He's like, yes, I have friends in Germany and Australia and, and Spain. And I'm like, how do you know all these people? Because kids, now, now you may be saying that's a red flag, what's your child doing and you don't know about it online. But the point is they're interconnected in a way that we never were. And when using these devices and this technology in a healthy way, they may very well become the change that we want to see in the world because they are not stuck in this little mindset of Grand Junction. They are interacting with people all over the world. Danny is keeping me updated on what's going on in Ukraine. Ukraine and I, I know I'm, I'm probably gonna get in a lot of trouble today based on what she's seeing on TikTok. And I'm not saying TikTok is always good, but she, has teenagers on TikTok 
talking about their life in other parts of the world. And she's coming to me saying, this is what's going on over there. Is it accurate? I don't know. But the point is we are interconnected in a way that we never have been before. And it's just something to think about. It's something for us to think about what is the strength in that? What are the dangers in that? But also perhaps where is the hope in that? Where is the hope in the fact that as we as a world community are understanding that life is so much more than our own little bubbles. Maybe we have some of these younger generations that just aren't going to understand what it means to be participating in a war for people that they don't even know why they're answering that call. Community. It's local and it's global. And I um, remember a few years ago when Danny was little, she was playing soccer and we would have our soccer practices at Long's Park. There was this woman that would come and she'd bring her boom box and she would like turn it on in Long's Park and she was teaching Zumba. And she would start dancing and then all of these people, these other young women, would start dancing with her. And then the whole park was dancing and Danny and Abby loved going to soccer practice because then after soccer practice, they were going and doing Zumba in the community. There was no pay. There was just people singing and dancing together. And it was so much fun. And I don't know if that still happens, but that's how you build community. We build community by showing up somewhere, by looking at somebody that we don't necessarily know or may seem scary, especially like if they're like two or three years old, they're really scary. But looking at somebody who doesn't look like you, who's not the same age as you, who you've never met before and just saying, hi, my name is Wendy. What is your name? It's simple. And it's not simple. And that, I think, is really what it means to be human right now, is that on some level, life is easier than it's ever been, and it's harder than it's ever been. And we're more connected than we've ever been. And we're more disconnected than we've ever been. And we're all here together just trying to make sense of what that dichotomy means. There is a cultural psychologist named Elena Connor, and she offered a TED talk called From Independence to Interdependence. And in this talk, she tells the story. She came from Nashville, Tennessee, and she went to school at Yale, and she realized that for about three years at Yale, she really didn't talk very much. And she thought it was just her who wasn't talking. And then she started looking around and she realized that there were other groups of people who also weren't talking. And she realized that what was happening was that there was some inter intercultural things going on. There were some of the other cultures that were coming from what she would consider a more interdependent paradigm where what, the way that you interact is relational, it's rooted, it's back and forth, it's listening, it's taking in. And what she realized, she was around a lot of very independent-minded people who were individual, unique, and free. But what was happening was that people that were coming from that interdependent 
culture, we're never having the opportunity to talk because all of the people that were coming from that very independent, this is my idea, active culture, we're doing all the talking and it wasn't good or bad. It was just a different way of viewing the, wor the world. And so she um, talks about how in Western cultures, the independence requires being talkative and excited and showing the way and forging a new path. But in Eastern cultures, leadership requires listening and being calm. And so she has spent her professional career, career now talking about the difference between these two things. And she says that we have both within us. Every one of us individually has that individual nature and we have that interdependent nature. And the key is finding that balance because both have their strengths and their gifts and both can have their downside. And so she says that if, you are having a conflict with somebody. She says, first, start and lead with your interdependence. Try to connect with them. Seek similarities. Find common ground. Because when we do that, when we come from that interconnected point of view, we're much more likely to figure out what the problem is and resolve it. But then if that doesn't work, she says, then you go to your independent nature. That's when you get to think outside of the box. You innovate. When you're being oppressed, our independent side of ourselves can help us get out of unhealthy or unsafe situations. So we need both. But the key is recognizing that there are two ways and then deciding when and how to assert our independence or to step back a little bit and invite our interdependence. And so I just want us to take a little bit of time to think about this today, this interdependent, independent understanding of community. I'm going to end with a quote from Martin Luther King, and he says, but the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform oppressors into friends. The type of love that I stress here is not eros, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, not philia, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is the understanding of goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love, which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. And finally, I think Eric Erickson sums the entire point up in this simple sentence. Life doesn't make sense without interdependence. We need each other. And the sooner we learn that, the better for all of us. And now with that, let us sing together, We'll Build a Land.
when all the people of the world love, then the strong will not overpower the weak. The many will not oppress the few. The wealthy will not mock the poor. The honored will not disdain the humble. The cunning will not deceive the simple. Mot se. And now we extinguish this flame that not the light of community, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Oh,